Hey, this is Mrs. Perman, and I can't be with you today, so I'm trying something new. We need to uh, go through our notes today, so please follow along in your notes as I um, tell you some of these things about cells and tissues. So, we've spent a bit of time talking about cells and cell structures, and in this next chapter, we're going to look at how cells in the human body come together to form these specialized um, tissues that perform different number of functions. There are four basic types. Epithelial, connective, muscle, and neural. Um, and as we go through these tissues, we are basically um, engaging in the study of histology. So I have a picture here in your notes that I find really helpful because um, if you take a good look at this, it takes the organization from atoms all the way up through the entire organ system. But if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, notice that we have our four types of tissues, and it gives you just the briefest thumbnail sketch of what each type of tissue is responsible for in the body. So if you look up there at epithelial, those are tissues that cover surfaces, they line passageways and chambers, and they produce glandular secretions. Connective tissues, though, will fill spaces, and they provide some support, and they're very important for storing energy. Of course, our muscle tissues um, produce con contractions that help us with movement, and neural tissues are specialized for conducting electrical impulses and carrying information. Take a moment and try to uh, fill in your uh, diagram in your notes from this. But remember, this is a picture from your book and you can still find this on your own. So we're going to begin by talking about epithelial tissue. So an epithelium is a layer of cells that is avascular. So I want you to think for a minute about that term, avascular. We've already studied the prefix a, which means without. And some of you probably remember that a vascular system, like when we say cardiovascular, refers to our circulatory system. So what this sentence means is that the epithelial layer of cells does not have a blood supply. They do form a barrier. They cover either an external surface, like your skin, or an internal surface, like your esophagus. They also, though, include specialized cells that can secrete different types of products, like your sweat. So we have a number of functions, and we're always going to want to go back and remember the job that these cells do for the body. So they provide protection. They control permeability. They also do provide sensations, and as we just said, they'll produce specialized secretions. All right, so at the beginning here, we're going to talk for a few minutes about glandular cells. So gland cells are epithelial cells that produce secretions, and we have a couple of different types. Exocrine secretions are released out onto the body surfaces. So I'm sure that you guys can think of an exocrine gland, something like a sweat gland. Now, endocrine secretions are a little bit different um, because instead of being released out onto a surface, they're released into that interstitial space surrounding the tissues. And then usually through, um, they're picked up by diffusion and another, other means and circulate throughout the body. So those would be things like hormones. All right, so when we think about epithelial tissues, the fact that they cover surfaces, um, you might think that since they're protective, these cells are joined together one to another 
in, um, they must be done very tightly so that uh, they actually create a barrier. So we have a couple of different types of ways that these cells are hooked together um, so that they can provide that protective barrier. So we're going to talk about tight junctions, gap junctions, and desmosomes. So if you take a look at this picture here, um, if you look at this top one labeled A, you'll see that basically I've got two cell membranes and these cell membranes look like they've been sewn together. They've been stitched together by really tight protein connections that go completely through the cell membrane from one cell to the next cell. So when you have a tight junction like this, it is very, very difficult for these cells to be separated from each other. And if you think about it, well, the cells that make up your skin, that's kind of an important function. We want them to have a very, very tight cell-to-cell -cell connection because they are acting as a barrier. They're preventing bacteria from being able to get into our body. They're also preventing our body from drying out. So we need these tight, tight junctions. Now, a little bit different than that is a gap junction. So a gap junction is just like it sounds. There's a place where you have membrane proteins that go completely through from one cell membrane to another cell membrane, but these membrane proteins have a hole in the middle. So they act, and there's a gap. So it's possible that material can move from one cell to a neighboring cell through a gap junction. So that allows intercellular communication. Um, to happen, especially in an epithelial cell. But a gap junction is just a small area of cells of the cell membrane that is joined together. So it's not as um, complete as you might find a tight junction. If you look at the, um, the last picture that I want you to think about, the desmosome, in this case you have anchoring proteins that are going from one side of skeleton to another side of skeleton um, between cells. And often what we're going to see with a desmosome is that it's just another way that these cells are anchored from one cell to the next. Helps to keep them more tightly joined together. At a tight junction, those outer surfaces are bound tightly together. These are the strongest intercellular connections. The gap junction, um, we've got the cells held together by membrane proteins that form a narrow passageway. And a desmosome has sort of a layer of cement between the cell membranes and that's reinforced by some protein fibers. Now, because epithelial cells are found on surfaces, some of those cells have microvilli or cilia um, on that exposed surface. And for example, in your respiratory passages, the coordinated beating of that cilia moves material along that surface. So if you think about it, in your airways, we have mucus down in the lungs that is constantly being moved up and out of the lungs, up through your trachea, up to the back of your throat by this movement of cilia on the surface of those epithelium. So here's a cell diagram which shows you um, the, the position of cilia and what microvilli might look like. Um, and in general, sort of a, an arrangement of epithelial cells. One of the other characteristics of an epithelial surface is that there is a structure called the basement membrane. So the lowest layer of the epithelium is connected to this non-cellular, so it's, it's not another layer of cells, but it is a combination of proteins and other material 
that forms a connection between the epithelium and whatever layer of cells or tissues that would be beneath that epithelium. But every epithelial tissue has a basement membrane. So, how does epithelium repair and uh, replace itself? Well, there's usually a layer of cells that will continue, that's sort of involved in continuous cell division. Um, and epithelial cells need this because they're constantly being worn away. They are surface cells. So if you think about your skin as being um, an example of epithelium that you're really familiar with, your epithelium is constantly being rubbed off and those cells are falling away. And so they're being replaced by a, a layer of actively dividing cells that we call the germinative cells. All right, now there's a number of different ways that we can um, talk about epithelia. We generally group them by the number of cell layers and the shape of the exposed cells. First of all, we have simple epithelium. Okay, that would be a single layer of cells um, covering a basement membrane. And so I've got a picture here showing you uh, an example of a, sim a simple epithelium. One layer of cells, basement membrane, and then some other different type of tissue beneath that. We can also have several cell layers, and in that case we're going to call it a stratified epithelium. And again, I have a picture over here that shows you that the surface of your tongue, where of course you would expect there's a lot of wear and tear, that you've got many cell layers in that epithelium before you reach the basement membrane. And then beneath that basement membrane, there's yet another type of tissue. We can also describe the shape of the cells. So one of the types would be squamous. And in squamous, these cells are very thin and flat. Um, I usually think of them as like um, being like a potato chip. They're, they're very, very thin. Often uh, they, they hardly look like there's much to them at all. Um, in this case, you are seeing that uh, they are found in places where you would expect um, that you want material to be able to move across those surfaces really quickly. So here we have in your lungs, you might have squamous epithelium in the very, very tiny air sacs called the alveoli. Some of the epithelium look like little hexagonal boxes. We're going to say that they are cuboidal. Here you see cuboidal epithelium that would be in your kidneys. And finally, we have columnar epithelium, and these look more like a rectangle. Um, so we, if you take a look at the picture over here, you've got long, tall epithelium, um, and they, are, they, they do look like a long rectangle. So here's another picture. You can see here in your trachea, you've got um, columnar epithelium. Um, you've got a basement membrane, you've got loose connective tissue underneath that. We're coming back to the glandular epithelia. Glandular cells may release their secretions through a couple of different methods, merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. So in this picture, which I'd like you guys to come back to on your own, you're going to see examples from the salivary glands, which are merocrine, mammary glands, which are apocrine, and your sweat glands or sebaceous glands, which are holocrine. So, merocrine secretions are the most common, and in this um, method, the, the product, whatever it is, whether it's your saliva or something else, is packaged in vesicles and it's released from the cell surface through exocytosis. In apocrine secretion, you have a loss of a bit of the cell as it is releasing that product. So you, you're getting, in, like in the mammary secretions, you're getting a little cytoplasm at the same time. And in holocrine secretions, you're going to destroy the cell in this process. 
So like with your sweat glands, when they produce that sweat, the cell bursts and that's what's released. And so those cells especially have to be constantly re